Everything you need to know about Japanese knives in under five minutes. In under seven minutes. Ten minutes. Everything you need to know about Japanese knives. We'll start things off talking about shapes. There are tons of different knife shapes in the Japanese knife world, so we're gonna start by talking about all the different shapes and what they do. The petty knife. This guy can be thought of as the Japanese equivalent to a utility knife. They're great for working off the board in your hand, trimming up fruits and vegetables like strawberries and Brussels sprouts. They're also an effective butchery knife and are great at breaking down chickens, deboning pork shoulders, and trimming up steaks. The bunka. This is an all-purpose knife, a little bit shorter, generally geared towards the home cook or the professional looking for a small, nimble knife. These guys are great for the up and down chopping motion, generally have a flatter profile to them, and have what's called a reverse tanto or K-tip on them, which makes more intricate work like shallots and garlic much easier. The santoku. The word itself translates to three virtues, which refers to slicing, dicing, and chopping, or meat, fish, and vegetables. Generally speaking, it tries to imply the extreme versatility of the knife, kind of can be thought of as like the cousin of the bunka, uh, generally geared towards the home cook or the professional looking for something smaller and more nimble. This guy is great for all sorts of tasks. The Nakiri. This guy is specifically designed for vegetable chopping. It's got a nice flat profile, no tip on it, uh, meant to be used in an up and down chopping motion. That flat profile means the majority, if not the entirety of the cutting edge contacts the cutting board when you're cutting with it. It also can be used as a scoop because of its large surface area. We generally recommend this knife to vegetarians or vegans or anyone who just blows through a lot of veg prep. The Asuba. This is the single beveled version of the Nakiri. You can also think of the Nakiri as the double beveled version of the Asuba. This guy is a little bit trickier to use because it's single beveled, meaning it only angles in from one side of the blade and is concave on the back side. This will change the cutting feel. It tends to wander a little bit away from your hand and also changes how the knife is sharpened. A little less versatile than the Nakiri, but a little bit better at that more intricate work. The Haneske. This guy was originally designed to break down chickens, but if it had legs, this guy can probably break it down. It's got a thick spine on it, and it's a little bit thicker behind the edge, which makes it less prone to chipping when working around bones and going through cartilage, but you should still not try to go through bones with this knife. It's got a reverse tanto tip, which makes it a lot easier to go in and around bones and through joints. The Deba. If a Haneske is used to break down things with legs, the Deba is used to break down things without legs that come from the sea, i.e. it is used to break down fish. It has quite a thick spine on it and a pretty steep learning curve. It is the best knife for breaking down fish, but it can take some time and effort to learn how to master. The Gyuto. This is the Japanese equivalent to your standard western style chef's knife and is easily the most versatile knife you'll come across. We generally recommend these to professionals as home cooks can sometimes find this knife a little bit too long, but if you're comfortable with this size of knife, it is going to do the most for you. You'll find Gyuto in varying lengths all the way from 180 millimeters all the way up to 300 millimeters. The Kritzke Gyuto. This guy is pretty much the same as the regular Gyuto, but differs in the shape of the tip. It has a reverse tanto or K-tip on it, which makes more intricate work like Brunois shallot and garlic easier. They generally speaking also have a flatter profile to them, which make them better at slicing. You'll find these in single beveled and double beveled versions. This guy that I'm holding is double beveled. The Sujihiki. The word itself translates to flesh slicer, which is quite apt as this knife is for just that, slicing flesh. Whether it's raw or cooked, this guy's long blade makes it easy to make long drawing strokes uh, and avoid having to saw through ingredients. The Yenagiba. This guy is for slicing as well, but generally reserved just for slicing raw fish. Again, its long slender blade means that you can make long drawing strokes and get those perfect slices every time. You'll see these a lot used for sashimi in sushi restaurants. Next, let's talk about blade construction. There are three main styles of blade construction in the Japanese knife world. All Japanese knives are generally made in a style called sanmai or forge welding, but what differs is the materials used as the cladding and the core steel. First, we'll talk about iron clad knives. These are knives that are made from iron on the outside layers and carbon steel through the core layer. All three of these materials are susceptible to rust and discoloration and must be kept wiped down dry and clean at all times. Next we have stainless steels. These knives again are made from three layers of material, but the outer layers are stainless and the core layer is stainless as well. Under normal circumstances, these knives will not rust or discolor on you, but we still recommend that you keep them dry, wiped down, and clean. 
Finally, we have a middle ground, which is the stainless clad knife. This knife has stainless layers on the outside and carbon through the core. Only past that wavy line is there exposed carbon steel on this blade, so that's the only part that could rust or discolor if it's not kept dry and clean. These are a great middle ground if you're interested in a carbon steel, but a little apprehensive about the maintenance required. If you make a mistake and don't wipe this guy down, only that small sliver of steel could possibly rust. Make sure to keep this guy dry, wiped down and clean, and make sure none of these styles of knives ever go in the dishwasher. We have a video on our channel that goes into more depth on this subject, but we should briefly talk about the different steel types you'll come across. We'll start by talking about carbon steels. There are two main types, shirogami or white paper carbon steel and aogami or blue paper carbon steel. Shirogami is the most pure of all the steels. It has the least elements added to it. It will require the most frequent sharpening, but will also be the most easily sharpened steel. Aogami is the same as shirogami, it just has a few elements added to it, which help to make it more machinable, easier to work with for the blacksmiths, and slightly less reactive than shirogami. Next we'll talk about Japanese stainless steels. There are steels like VG1 Gold and VG10, which are relatively easy to sharpen and hold their edge quite well, on par or slightly better than carbon steels. There are also Japanese super stainless steels like R2 slash SG2, HAP40, and ZDP189. These steels can be very difficult to sharpen, but hold their edge an extremely long time. Next, we'll talk about Japanese knife finishes. This is probably the category that will give most newbies the most trouble. There's a lot of different words that you need to learn here, so let's get into it. First, let's talk about the kuruuchi finish. This translates to first black, and it refers to this black finish here on the blade. Generally speaking, these knives will be a little bit more affordable as this style of finish cuts down on labor, but that's not always the case. This finish also can help protect a little bit from rust, though it is certainly not foolproof, and we still recommend you keep this knife dry and clean. Next, we'll talk about the tsuchime finish. This refers to the hand-hammered marks you see on the blade here. The tsuchime finish will probably vary the most of all the finishes that you see, and every blacksmith kind of has their own style. It's achieved by attaching a textured head to the hammer before hammering the pattern into the blade. Some people would argue that this finish helps food release from the blade a little bit easier. In our experience through testing, if it makes any difference at all, it's very, very minimal. Mostly an aesthetic feature. Next we'll talk about migaki. The word itself translates to polish, so generally you'll see a hairline polish on knives that are described as migaki. They're not quite mirror finish, but they have a pretty consistent satin finish to them. A polished finish like this can help the knife slide through food a little bit easier than some of the other finishes we'll show you. Damascus. This refers to pattern welded steels. Pattern welding will create this wavy design in the knife that you see here. It's achieved by layering the steel and folding it a number of times during the forging process. This does not add anything to the performance of the knife and is purely an aesthetic feature. You may also come across the term suminagashi, which refers to a style of Damascus, which is meant to emulate the art of Japanese marbling. Next is the mirror finish. This is sort of a cousin to the megaki finish. These knives are generally more expensive as it takes a lot of time and effort to polish these guys up to such a mirror-like finish. These are also quite difficult to maintain the finish on as uh, that mirror polish will start to fade the more you use the knife. The Kasumi finish. This term refers to the hazy, cloudy cladding contrasted with the polished core steel. You'll see on this knife, it's got sort of this cloudy sort of bit here where the cladding comes to an end and then you see the more polished core steel poking out beyond that. Finally, you'll encounter knives that have many finishes. This knife, for instance, the Hatsukakoro Inazuma Bunka, has a Nashiji, Tsuchime, almost Kuruuchi, Damascus, and Kasumi finish on it. Generally speaking, the more finishes the knife has, the more expensive it will be. We have a longer video on this subject as well, so check that out if you're interested, but let's talk quickly about maintenance. Whether your knife is stainless steel or carbon steel, it's important to keep it wiped down, dry, and clean at all times. Never put it in the dishwasher, wash with hot soapy water and a non-abrasive cloth. When using your knife, never cut through anything that you wouldn't bite through. This includes bones, shells, nuts, hard candies, hard cheese rinds, basically anything other than a boneless protein or vegetables and fruit. Furthermore, when you're using your knife, never twist, torque, or pry your knife in an ingredient on your cutting board or in a can. And when we say no dishwasher, we really mean it, no dishwasher. 
Every knife, no matter how high of a quality it is, will need to be sharpened at some point. Now you may be tempted to use a pull-through sharpener, but we would highly recommend you stay away from these as they will ruin the profile of your knife and may cause little chips. The only true way to sharpen your knife is using a Japanese whetstone. We have lots of resources on our channel on how to sharpen a knife, and we also teach classes at both of our shops located in Etobicoke and Hamilton. For a quick edge maintenance while you're prepping or between trips to the whetstone, a ceramic honing rod is suitable. We recommend you stay away from steel rods with those little ridges in them or diamond sharpening rods. Next, we'll talk about the anatomy of both double beveled and single beveled knives. This will help you understand the difference between the two. Anatomy of a double beveled knife. We have the tip, the spine, the heel, koba, the belly, flat spot, shinogi line, clad line, tang, choil, ferrule, the handle, the hira, kiriha, and the kanji. On single beveled knives, the tip, the spine, the heel, the shinogi, hira, koba, kiriha, kanji, and on the back side, we have the uraoshi, which is the perimeter, the urasuki, which is the hollow part, and the jizakai, where the cladding wraps around the back of the blade. Before we let you go, here are some just general terms that are good to know and that you'll likely come across when shopping for a knife. First, let's talk about OOTB or out of the box. This term generally is used when describing the sharpness level of a knife when it is received from shipping. Next is BTE or behind the edge. This term is used to describe the edge geometry of a blade and generally helps to describe whether the knife is a laser or a workhorse. Speaking of which, a laser is generally described as a knife that is very, very thin behind the edge. When you flex the edge on a nail, you'll likely see a little bit of bending in the edge of the knife. These knives are extremely sharp, fly through ingredients, but are very delicate and generally are not recommended for beginner users. Workhorse knives are those that won't show any nail flex. They are generally a little bit thicker behind the edge, and while they still have a very nice cutting feel, they're not going to fly through ingredients quite as easily as a laser knife. The trade-off here is that they're much less delicate and less prone to chipping. You will generally come across two different styles of handles in the Japanese knife world, those being the Yo style or Western style handle. These guys are pretty similar to anything you've probably used before, generally either single, double, or triple riveted. Sometimes the tang comes all the way through, sometimes it only comes about halfway. Not an indication of the quality of the knife though, if the tang comes only halfway, still is a great knife. The wa style handle is the traditional Japanese style handle and it generally consists of two parts, the ferrule and the handle itself. You'll find many different shapes including octagonal, D-shaped and oval shaped handles. Now there's no difference in terms of performance between these two styles of handles and generally speaking the western style handles will hold up a little bit better than the Japanese style handles but that all depends on exactly what material they're made from. If they're made from natural woods, if they go into the dishwasher or are left submerged in water, they'll react like any natural wood would and expand or contract causing the wood to crack. I hope this video helped you understand Japanese knives a little bit better. This is just the tip of the iceberg, so if you have more questions, feel free to give us a shout, email us, or come down to one of our shops located in either Hamilton or Etobicoke. If you got value from this video, make sure to slice up that like button and subscribe to our channel for more knife-related content. Until the next time, stay sharp. Pew pew.